Welcome to the Protocol Town Hall, a periodic guest talk series focused on protocols and protocol research. In today's researcher salon, we will be speaking with Steve Huey about his time writing and producing comedy for TV and a talk entitled TV Protocols, What's the Deal? There's a link to the SOP forum in the chat where we will host any conversation during the salon in addition to readings of the week and other protocol musings. Our next town hall will be a guest talk on Wednesday, March 20th with Jonathan Blake and Nils Gilman of the Bergeron Institute. You can find Summer of Protocols research, the program calendar, along with more information about the protocol kit at summerofprotocols.com. And I'll hand it off to Venkat to introduce our speaker for today. All right, uh, really excited about today's talk. And um, I'll start the introduction by first thanking you, Steve, uh, as a representative of the entire crew behind the office, because my entire career is based on the show, The Office, from writing a blog post about it. And that's how my consulting career started. Uh, but yeah, uh, when I was living in LA for um, a few years, I came back to Seattle six months ago. Um, uh, Steve reached out and we met up a couple of times. We went on a hike. Um, so yeah, over the blog post as it happens. And he was the only Hollywood friend I ever managed to make. It's a very close job subculture of LA. And uh, so I'm pleased to have made at least one uh, Hollywood friend. Uh, but uh, Steve... Uh, has also written a novel, which I recommend how I became a famous um, novelist. And the reason I'm mentioning this is um, that's also kind of very protocol-ish because the uh, protagonist there, um, he makes a living uh, writing uh, college entrance essays for foreign students. So that's another very protocolized kind of writing. Uh, so TV comedy, uh, college entrance exams, these are like kinds of writing that I think of as the other end of the spectrum from the kind most of us do in, in that there's like lots of invisible structure that you don't see and the output can look very organic and um, immersive and you don't see what goes on behind the scenes. And if you're living in Hollywood, um, as I did for a couple of years, and you go on like studio tours, there's this experience you get of, oh, there's these TV shows and movies I really love. And there's this, you know, it's escapist fantasy for you. Then you go to the Hollywood studios and it's a mix of like enlightening insight and like a feeling of serious let down, uh, being let down. Like, you know, uh, I went to one studio where they had the shark from Jaws. It's this mechanical thing that's just sitting in a lake and during the tour, they show you how the shark comes up. It's like, ah, oh, shit, this is like just a cheap magic trick and I completely fell for it. And like, you know, it sort of a little bit ruins the Jaws movie for you. But on the other hand, you really appreciate learning all the mechanics of what goes on. And I think even though on the studio tours, you don't get to like uh, sit in on like writer's rooms and see the protocols of how the writing actually happens. Uh, from what I've like learned from a distance, apparently it's, again, like extremely... Uh, complex machine that produces this stuff. And I'm hoping, Steve, that you'll give us the same mix of like enlightenment and feeling a little let down at the nature of the magic trick. So really looking forward to uh, the stock. So over to you. Yes, I'm happy to uh, attempt to provide some enlightenment plus letdown. I think I can deliver on that. Um, I've watched several of the talks. Um, I think I watched most of them actually, and I have really been inspired and enjoyed um, the idea of protocol uh, thinking as a category and uh, trying to apply that thinking to uh, the kind of work that I do has yielded some insights that I'm going to share with you guys. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here so I can uh, work with the deck that I've prepared. Uh, let me see how I do that. Resume share. Stop share. And I'll share my screen. Share. Okay. We're going to go to a slideshow view. And this is the title of my talk Towards Some Protocols for Producing TV Comedy or uh, TV Protocols What is the Deal? Guys, I wanted to start, uh, my, my talk is going to be structured sort of in a three-act way, which is how um, most scripts are structured. Uh, but first, we're going to have a little bit of a cold open, which is just like um, the first thing that happens that's trying to get your interest. And I just wanted to talk about a couple sort of associations that came to mind uh, when I thought about protocols. The first one is this guy, uh, the protocol droid uh, C-3PO. That's probably the first time that I ever heard the word uh, protocol. 
uh, when I saw this movie when I was like six or seven or so. And you guys will remember C-3PO. He's, I had to look up whether they meant protocol droid in the sense of diplomacy and uh, navigating like social cultural protocols, which is what they meant. Uh, I guess in some sense, R2-D2, who uh, C-3PO is hanging out with, is a protocol droid in the sense of being capable of hacking into various systems uh, and interacting with them in a technical way. But it's very interesting that one of the first characters you meet in Star Wars or early on in the Star Wars universe is like basically a sort of polished diplomat. And that's what they meant by the word protocol, like knowing the procedures that are cultural and the invisible scripts that are being operated in the various um, the planets, worlds that these guys are encountering. C-3PO is kind of an annoying and uh, somewhat fey uh, character. He's not uh, really brave and strong. And I wonder if you guys in approaching protocols may have a challenge there that we sort of associate it with being kind of like fastidious and fussy. I thought of another uh, famous protocol guy and I brought him up to um, Thinkat. He's not as famous, but this guy is named um, Angier Biddle Duke. And he was the chief of protocol for the State Department uh, during the Kennedy administration. And he's kind of a he was kind of a well-regarded guy in the uh, administration. He always knew how to do everything exactly properly. He was a Duke uh, in the sense of he was from the Duke tobacco family that they named Duke University after. And he was uh, so he was wealthy, brought up in the finest social circles. And one of his his sort of masterpiece of protocol was organizing the funeral for John Kennedy. Uh, which doesn't, you know, doesn't sound like a big challenge, but you've got like the president of France, the uh, emperor of Ethiopia, people from the British royal family were all descending on Washington in a short period of time. And it was Angier Biddle's Duke job to orchestrate the protocol so that nobody would be offended, so that these people could come and be positioned in the right place in a way that wouldn't cause any problems. Here's uh, the result of his work. You can see uh, here's de Gaulle. Here's uh, Halle Selassie, uh, Emperor of Ethiopia, the president of West Germany at the time. He had to arrange all these people in a way that no one would feel hurt and offended, which seemingly a uh, kind of small job, a, a bit of diplomacy, but that's really what diplomacy is all about, right? Following a protocol that can allow people to interact in a safe way. And that led me to think that maybe um, in talking to people, I was putting out the word protocol and asking them what that meant to them. And uh, a lot of people brought up like the idea of diplomatic protocol, how to behave when you're in the sort of situation where people are of different status and you have to figure out how to navigate that, or they may be coming from different cultural assumptions. And a lot of people also mentioned uh, safety protocols, common associations with the word. And that made me just sort of think in a bigger way about protocols that maybe protocols are a way to think about them is there's something designed to navigate an intersection of two things. And uh, it, it's possible that all protocols really are safety protocols. They're designed to avoid everything from uh, a small embarrassment to an industrial accident or a breakdown of a computer system. So just in thinking about uh, protocols in the biggest possible way, that's where uh, my mind went. And I just wanted to share that with you guys. I'm sure you guys have probably talked about all of this in depth, but as a uh, person who's new to protocol thinking, this is where I went. I sort of got my mind to the protocol is kind of non-material stuff you should know and how to operate and that knowing the protocol is always valuable. You know, if you said to somebody, hey, you're coming to Hollywood, you should know the protocol, that would be a valuable piece of advice. And I'm gonna kind of structure my talk uh, around the protocols we have here in Hollywood. I also sort of got to thinking that protocol uh, can be a way of thinking about uh, a, a, an engine of comedy. If you imagine, this is Larry David from Curb Your Enthusiasm, and if you imagine the structure of a Curb Your Enthusiasm episode, a lot of it is about this sort of cranky guy questioning a protocol. What does it mean to give a gift? Why do we do things this way? How do Why do we uh, break up the restaurant bill in this way? And he's kind of a curmudgeon who's out of the system. He doesn't mind challenging the protocol, and that drives basically every curb your enthusiasm episode. And so I think you could think about, um, thinking about protocol could be a productive way to generate uh, comedy. Here's the folks from Big Bang Theory. Don't know if anybody's a fan of that show out there, but Big Bang Theory in a way is a, a show about people who are running different protocols and their interactions. Like these guys, the, the nerds, they know all about scientific protocol. They know everything about physics, but they just don't know the protocol to operate around uh, an attractive woman who works at the Cheesecake Factory. I know I've talked to Venkat about an episode of uh, Big Bang Theory where Sheldon has uh, planning for a Christmas gift exchange with uh, Kelly Cuoco's character Penny. He's bought every he's bought 
presents at every price category. So she's going to give him a present and he's anticipating, okay, whatever price category it is, I'll have something ready to go to give to her. And then she, of course, has brought him something priceless. I think it was like a, a signature of Richard Feynman or something that's priceless to him. And he has no idea. She's broken his protocol by being like a human about it. So it was just leading me to think that a lot of comedies exist at a place where protocol is breaking down. Here's a clip from The Office. And in thinking about The Office, uh, I know Venkat's uh, essay I highly recommend uh, about The Office, but if you think about The Office, uh, the American version, it's Michael Scott's character, uh, Steve Carell, is, he's at the work, but he's running the protocol of family or friends. Like he wants everyone to love him and like him. So he's running the wrong protocol for the situation that he's in. And that leads to a lot of misunderstandings and communications and drives a lot of office episodes. Everybody else in the office, you know, Dwight is running like protocol of like, I'm in a ruthless Machiavellian fight for power. And basically everybody else uh, is running the protocol of like, I'm punching in and trying to get my paycheck and get out of here. And the conflicts of people running different protocols create the comedy of the office. So it was yielding some uh, productive thinking for me as a uh, way to approach comedy and possibly create it. And it seems like where you have situations where the protocol breaks down, uh, you often have comedy when people are running opposing scripts or uh, differing scripts or don't understand each other's scripts. And it could also turn into a tragedy story. And the question of where something becomes comedy or tragedy is uh, an interesting one and you can spend a lifetime thinking about. So that's the opening of uh, my talk, just some musings on protocol at the highest level, which I admire you guys for sort of um, opening up that conversation. So I'm gonna structure my talk in the following way. I'm gonna imagine that all of us together are gonna to create a TV show. And I'm gonna walk through how we would go about doing that. And we're in, in the process of doing it, we're going to reveal some basically um, understood but more or less invisible protocols to people who are not in this industry and kind of examine them and see how they came about and uh, what their meaning is. So let's imagine that we're creating a show called The Protocols Gang. It's about a group of friends who are obsessed with protocols and how we're gonna navigate life and love. That's the premise of our show. Um, to give us a little visual, I um, went over to uh, Dolly and I put in uh, the following prompt. I said, create a logo for a 90s sitcom called The Protocols Gang about a group of friends who are obsessed with protocols. Use the writer Venkatesh Rao as a, a reference and it generated um, these. I'm sure some of the technical people out there could explain to me why it is that uh, Dolly like refuses to put proper text in there. I don't know if that's like a copyright issue or something, but I was unable to make it do it. Probably with a bit of Photoshop work, I could create it. But it, it created a, a sort of awkward uh, simulacrum of like a 90s uh, sitcom. So we'll start there. Let's imagine we're trying to create a show like this that's in the spirit of Friends or Big Bang Theory with protocols at its heart. So how are we gonna make a show like this? How do we get it made? We have this idea, we're inspired by it. We wanna get it on television. What are our steps that we're gonna do? First thing we're probably gonna to have to do is get through the first layer, uh, which is agents and managers, or what we usually lump under the, the broader title representation. These are people who are out here and they represent talent and they're sort of the middlemen between um, people who have a creative idea and people who are who are producing, have the money to produce something like that. And they're sort of in a divided category, which is a little fuzzy and blurry. Um, you probably, if you're thinking of uh, the uh, like typical agent, a, a frequently depicted character actually kind of looks like this. This is uh, Ari from uh, Entourage, some of you guys might be familiar with. Not that far actually from a fairly typical Hollywood agent who's doing like deal making and calling people and trying to get you the best possible deal. Managers and agents are kind of a split uh, division uh, in the world of representation. Agents are specifically uh, about negotiating your deal. Managers aren't really supposed to do that. Uh, the trade-off for the manager is that they can actually be a producer on the project. That's the big win for them because that's a lot more like to be a producer on a, a hit show is a lot more lucrative than just taking 10% of the creator's money. And so that's kind of a gap between agents and managers. They do blur, blur together. And we have had some problems with the fuzziness of this uh, situation where you're like represented by these people who might have like kind of confused financial interests. The Writers Guild of America, the union guild that represents all of us writers had a big fight with agents uh, in the last couple of years 
basically because agents had like WME Endeavor, the, one of the big agencies had started a production company. And so you could see, and they had also started a process called packaging where they would take a chunk of the, they'd basically be a producer on a project. And you could see how that would, if you think about it uh, at a high level, you can see how that would create like some financial weird incentives. Like your agent might be incentivized then to like cut your budget so that the show could be more profitable for the agency that was getting money as a producer rather than just representing you, the creator of the show. Anyway, that's a lot of like kind of complicated information, but there are basically these people who are middle operators, men and women. There's some of the most famous have been women and they are designed to sort of navigate the relationship between creative talent and money. And that's an awkward relationship. And uh, it's valuable to have people who can, for one thing, absorb bad news. And for another, like kind of make sure that no one gets in an embarrassing situation. However, it breaks apart frequently. This is an example. I don't know if any of you guys are fans of the Larry Sanders show. This is Gary Shandling playing Larry Sanders. This is Bob Odenkirk playing his agent in the show. At the time uh, of the Larry Sanders show, uh, Gary Shandling, the actor, ended up actually suing his manager, Brad Gray, because he felt that his manager was, um, rep you know, screwing Gary out of opportunities that should have been his. He had other clients and he felt like he wasn't being represented fairly. And he put that into the show. So the final season of the Larry Sanders show, I think, has a long storyline about being screwed over by your manager. There are a lot of like the amount of art that's about uh, the breakdown of show business is frequent. And that speaks to times when the protocols um, basically break down. But let's assume that we've gotten ourselves an agent or a manager who's interested in the idea of a show about protocols. So what's the first thing that's going to happen? We're going to go out and pitch the show. We're going to take it to various buyers, present it to them and try and convince it to them, uh, convince them that this is a valuable project that's going to make them a lot of money or win them a lot of awards or somehow um, be valuable for them to produce. And the first step in that is going to be making a pitch. And the pitch itself has kind of a protocol. Here we see Don Draper like, you know, making his pitch. There is a lot of art about uh, doing pitches and pitching, of course, occurs in a lot of places in business. Any of you guys who are doing any sales or like trying to raise money have done pitches. And there's a particular um, format to the way the pitches go down that we're going to get into. But in thinking about it, I sort of was considering an anomaly and it may be in other businesses too, but writers who are making, who are the people who have to make the pitch have probably not heard that many. And the executives who are listening have heard hundreds. All they do all day long is listen to pitches. Uh, and so it's kind of interesting that like we who are out there doing the pitches might not know a lot about like the typical formats or what people are doing. And this can be kind of a, a glitchy part of the basically protocol of producing television. Uh, some writers also complain too that they like their job is not uh, putting on a show. Their job is writing a successful script and they might be very good at writing and not particularly good at like public speaking and making a sexy pitch. Um, I know that my wife sometimes complains about that. She's a writer too. And she doesn't feel as comfortable in sort of like the song and dance part of selling the show and what it's going to be. She thinks she's really good at writing the scripts and she is, but like there's the step you have to get through where you are just selling the concept before you can get paid to actually write the script. On the other hand, though, like the ultimate goal here is producing a show and putting on a little bit of a show doesn't seem to me to be um, uh, a wrong part of the process. Like if we're going to if the ultimate goal is going to be creating a show that's on television, it doesn't seem crazy to me to begin with a process where you just have to put on a little bit of a show. And if your talent is writing scripts and not necessarily like song and dance stuff, that's unfortunate. But it's like a part of the game that we have to go through the process of um, doing the pitch. So in the pitch, uh, I, my information about this is coming mostly from executives who listen to a lot of these pitches because I myself have done them a lot, but I haven't seen hundreds of others the way they have. And I asked an executive, basically, what is the format that you're looking to hear from a pitch? And he broke it down for me in the following way. First of all, you want to hear, here's something that's going on culturally or something that's going on in your life or something that you've observed, a sociological phenomenon, something that people can... Uh, 
tap into. A couple of years ago, there was a big, um, a lot of pitches came out about like kids moving back with their parents. That was a phenomenon that had been, articles had been written about. People were experiencing it. There were several sitcom pilots that were based on that premise. If you can start with some sociological phenomenon like that, you're likely to excite the executives a little bit. They're looking for something that's going to have some kind of cultural frisson or whatever. Then you as the writer want to say something like, this is how it's affected me or how I've seen it. You want to make the case for why you in particular are the person to tell this story. There has to be some genuine connection between you and the project. Then you want to go into sort of selling the characters. And the exec I was talking to suggested that you never really want to use adjectives. You don't want to say like, this is a curmudgeonly kind of guy or this is a stubborn kind of guy. You want to phrase everything in the form of like, this is the kind of guy who would spend 20 minutes ordering his burrito because he's so specific about what ingredients he wanted in it. Or this is the kind of guy who'd go on a hike with a random guy who just happened to email him because he read his blog post. Like you want to summon up a world of story uh, through your descriptions of your characters because it's more efficient. Now the executives are starting to see the situations these people are going to get into. And then you want to end, you have to end with a bit of sizzle and hype and like psyching people up for why this show will be exciting or groundbreaking or uh, dynamic. So I think here, if we're making a show about protocols, we have kind of an interesting premise. There, there is, people are talking about protocols. We could point to the uh, summer of protocols and what's going on with Ethereum and people are starting to think about protocols in a new way. We could come up with a few characters. I'm looking at you guys and I'm seeing, uh, there's probably some pretty idiosyncratic people out there. We may want to uh, make it a little di more diverse than what I'm looking at on my screen, but we could generate that. And then we'd want to uh, just use you guys to create, just summon in the minds of an executive some funny situations that we'd be seeing. And we'd say, here's why you have to do it right now. Here's why it's happening. And we'd get people excited. Unfortunately, guys, um, at the moment, kind of bad news because there are not that many buyers for TV shows. So the number of places where we're going to be pitching is uh, going to be pretty small. So in our goal of making this show, we're uh, kind of limited. Now, when I first got into television, uh, I, I started in 2002, 2003, and there were a lot of pilots being made. I have a graphic about that here somewhere. This is pilots ordered by the big six, basically the broadcast networks, NBC, ABC, Fox, et cetera. In 2004, they ordered 120 pilots. So there were a lot of people who got a big payday uh, writing TV shows and creating them. Last year, they ordered 14. So it's been much, much reduced. And I think you guys know why that's happening, basically, is broadcast television is dying. Uh, streamers are taking over. Now, in the world of uh, pitching, uh, there are a lot of proto sort of unspoken informal protocols to uh, mitigate both uh, embarrassment for everybody involved and to uh, keep anybody from having to say bad news. It's a very, it's sort of like, um, I, I don't know, I imagine it might be somewhat similar to like um, an imperial court or something where nobody wants to deliver bad news to anybody. And that's a big reason why agents and managers exist. Like they can, you're not going to hear from ABC that they're not buying our show about protocols. They're going to call your agent. Your agent's going to tell you, hey, they weren't feeling it for this or that reason, which may or may not be true, might just be a lie, but that is what they'll be telling you. And Part of that is to preserve relationships and to preserve embarrassment. They don't know if you're going to be uh, the next superstar and they really don't want to offend you if that happens. They also don't want to look stupid if they've passed on a big idea. There are a lot, I can think of a uh, top of my head, like an executive who's out there who, pa who famously passed on The Walking Dead, huge successful uh, zombie show and uh, made a lot of money for the people who ended up making it. And the, the story, you know, if you ever were pitching to this guy, it couldn't hurt to suggest like, hey, you know, this show could be the next Walking Dead. You wouldn't want to embarrass him directly, but if you suggested like, hey, you don't want to make this mistake again, that could be a helpful way to go. So the protocol of pitching involves a lot of like, diplomatic uh, work and to avoid pissing anybody off, to, to allow everybody to keep working together in the future, even if they're not biting on your particular idea. Now, because we're dealing with um, streamers instead of broadcast television, like the kind of show we're gonna be making is less like those 90s sitcom uh, graphics I showed you earlier. So I typed into uh, Dolly to have it make a uh, same show, a show about protocols uh, starring Venkatesh Rao, but um, uh, for a streamer. 
So it would have to be if you if you've looked at what streamers are making, they're not making shows like Friends anymore. They're like the the Emmy for best comedy last year went to went to The Bear. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but that's a show about a high stress kitchen situation in Chicago. It's not super funny um, in the sense of like a 90s comedy with jokes every three lines. It's a little more intense and personal and dramatic. And for whatever reason, the business model of the streamers is favoring that kind of thing. Now there are like feelings and, and movements here in Hollywood that people are missing that kind of like big funny show that those things aren't existing. And Abbott Elementary has been sort of like a, a surprise, uh, a, a, unusual unicorn kind of hit for ABC in the classic sitcom old. It's got a bunch of jokes, a bunch of funny characters. It's on a broadcast network and still hit that target. It's just a little harder than it was to do like in the boom days of network television. Sorry, guys, I zipped through my slides a little bit. I did just want to mention, um, I, I was interested in Jeff Manos talk about um, burglar ways in and kind of burglar thinking uh, in terms of protocols. And I did want to mention that the way we've just described of creating a show where we come up with a pitch and we pitch it to a bunch of buyers, we get an agent to set up meetings for us. That's just kind of standard way in. And uh, we'd be able to do that if we had a little bit of cred and credibility, but it can be hard to just get an agent on the phone or a manager on the phone or to set those pitches or to set them with somebody who has the power to green light your shows. And there are uh, many cases in Hollywood of kind of burglar ways of navigating that protocol, avoiding that uh, to create your shows. And that they usually involve making something. Famous example is um, South Park. I think the guys who created South Park, they created like some kind of little animated Christmas card that uh, made the rounds in the early days of like emailing stuff. And it just was funny and people liked it. People were like, who are these guys? What are they doing? Do they have a funny show? And now they're being sought out rather than them going in being like, hey, we have a funny show about some kids in Colorado and we have this cool animation style. Same thing with Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I think the guys who made that were struggling actors out here in LA. They just started filming on VHS, something that evolved into the show Always Funny, uh, Sunny. It was cheap. They could do it themselves and they could sh they could have a sort of proof of concept demonstration, which I imagine applies to like a lot of fields. You know, if you can have a demo product, it's a lot more compelling than just uh, spinning your wheels on why you guys need to invest mil a million dollars right now. So I go write the script and, and we get it together. Some friends of mine who are writers uh, broke in through a sort of burglar way that I thought was pretty interesting. They created and produced their own comedy magazine and they slid it into um, issues of LA Weekly, which is like an alternative weekly that used to be uh, found in newsstands and coffee shops all over LA. And eventually a copy of this magazine fell out of an LA Weekly that was in the car of a television executive. He picked it up and read it and thought these guys were funny and uh, found their contact info and brought them in for a meeting. And that's a that, that was a, a story of some guys breaking into Hollywood through a sort of burglar uh, method. So anyway, guys, it would be pretty tough to sell our show protocols, even though we have um, some interesting dynamics and we could probably put a pretty good pitch together. However, for the purpose of this talk, we're going to assume that the buyers are hooked. They bought it in the room. They want us to uh, make the show called Protocols, so we're going to do it. We're going to skip through a whole set of procedures, which would happen then. The protocol would be, okay, we're buying the show. Now we need to write an outline. That's going to be maybe 10 pages describing the show. It's going to have a lot of scenes. The network or the studio uh, or both are going to give us a lot of feedback on that. Then we're going to go ahead and write a script. We're going to give that to the network in the studio. They're going to give that a, a lot of feedback as well. Those are called notes. You're going to have to listen to a lot of nonsense and bullshit. And it might change a lot because of whatever the mandate is for that particular place. Like when they buy our show protocols, they may be looking for um, really positive, sunny shows about friends. And by the time we turn our script in, they may have changed their mandate to be, we're looking for really dark, edgy shows about uh, workplaces uh, that uh, appeal to uh, viewers of The Bear. So we might have to change our script according to those structures that are happening at a level way above our pay grade. That's basically the procedure of how we would get our pilot to the point where we're going to get it produced. I'm going to jump ahead to that part of the process, and we're going to talk about how we, let's assume that our show Protocols has been greenlit, and we're actually going to produce 10 episodes of it. And here's how we go through that and some of the protocols we're going to encounter. So act two of my talk, we're underway on making this show. 
So here it is. The first thing we've got to do is generate the scripts. That's where everything starts. That's sort of the blueprint for the show. You can't film without a script. Even Curb Your Enthusiasm or a show that's fairly improvisational usually has a pretty dense outline or something to work with. You need that information just to get cameras in the right place and what kind of props you need and everything like that to get production going. So the first thing we're going to do is form up into a writer's room. This is a photo of uh, the writer's room at the office. And this is a fairly typical... Uh, Everything about it is pretty typical. The people who are here, the people who are around the table, the kind of sloppiness of it. Uh, the people in the back here, these are the writer's assistants. And actually, it's actually kind of surprising because um, I think people think of being a TV writer or uh, movie writer is a little different, but being a TV writer, you might think that most of your day is going to be sitting there typing and it's actually not, it's talking. Uh, most of what you guys are going to be doing is like talking about the show and kind of forging a rough consensus. These people are going to be taking notes, uh, writing everything down. Uh, if they're good at their job, they're going to make sure to get down anything that's funny that makes people laugh. They're going to get it down exactly as it's said, because that's really important. Even changing one word or two can like take away the comedy of something. On the screens here, we can all see the script. If we're at the level where we're working through the script at a line by line level, this guy here is going to be running the room. He's probably got a keyboard behind there, so he can actually make changes that we can see. And the rest of us are all arguing about it. So this is the writer's room, which is where the show is going to uh, get put together. It's a very long uh, quote from Tina Fey's uh, New Yorker article that became part of her book. I'm not. Don't worry if you can't read this quote in the time. If you're bored of my talk, you can take a look at it. I have all this stuff in a leave behind that I'm going to send to you guys. But basically, she's saying that... Um, in putting together writer's rooms, what she likes to do is combine sort of Harvard type intellectuals, people like me, with people who are like Chicago style improvisers and performers, people who've actually been on a stage in front of an audience. And her argument is that th that creates a good friction between people who, you know, can have highbrow ideas and think of pretty interesting intellectual stuff and people who know what like a meat and potatoes comedy audience is actually going to laugh at, who've been up there sweating, trying to make an audience laugh, and they know what they need to do to make that happen. And in her worldview, that's going to create uh, the best kind of comedy. So this is the Harvard Lampoon. It's a, sort of a combination of like a frat house and a magazine. It's where I got my start. A lot of TV writers came out of there. Conan O'Brien, Colin Jost. Um, and it's it, it, it's a famous uh, nursing ground for TV comedy writers. For one thing, you just learn. I was able to learn that this was a job you could get paid to do. A lot of people don't know this protocol. You can learn it in this building. Increasingly, people are learning other places. NYU famously has produced a lot of people through improv groups. And the word about being a TV writer has kind of gotten out that this is a cool, fun uh, job. It's been depicted in a lot of shows. It was in 30 Rock and stuff. And I think more and more people aspirationally wanted to get into it. And the internet has allowed more and more people to demonstrate their stuff. A lot of people come through comedy one way or another, either as performers or writers. So there are other ways to get into it. But that historically was a model for how to create these things. So a couple thoughts about the writer's room and how it works. As I mentioned, it's more talking than writing. It's basically um, forming a creative consensus through argument, talk, conversation. There's a lot of like what we sometimes call host chat, like basically just talking about your own life, experiences you had that day, uh, what's going on with you. And famously, every story on the show, Everybody Loves Raymond, came out of something that happened in one of the writer's lives, like, you know, a fight with their wife that they had or something like that. Every single episode of Everybody Loves Raymond came from somebody being like, I was on vacation, my wife lost the keys, they fell down the elevator shaft, this happened, blah, blah, blah. There's also historically like lots of snacks and candy and stuff around. And I remember mentioning this once to my, to my dentist. And she said, well, yeah, you know, you writers, you have to eat a lot of candy because the brain uh, consumes a lot of sucrose. I don't know whether that's true or not, but uh, it seems like a fair uh, excuse for why there's always like tons of food and stuff lying around writers rooms. And then like the room will be kind of loose, but not too loose. Like in some ways, it's a very freeing kind of creative workspace. And in other ways, not at all. I would say that the number one uh, protocol that is, is observed in TV comedy writing rooms and that um, if you guys were going to go work on one tomorrow, I would make sure to tell you is like the principle of yes and, which sort of comes out of uh, improv. I put up um, this book called Truth and Comedy that was created by Del Close and Turner Halpern, and they were kind of they kind of invented improv comedy, which is standing on a stage 
getting suggestions from an audience and forming a scene out of it. And in improv comedy, the very first thing you want to do is make sure to yes and anybody else in your scene. So if I come in and say, hey, uh, I'm here to see the doctor, you would never say, like, I'm not a doctor. You'd have to take what I said, that you're, I'm here to see a doctor, build on it. Just build on what everybody else is saying. It doesn't do any good to shoot something down. And you can see how much this makes sense in an improv comedy scene. There's a very funny example, by the way, of... Uh, it's a clip that's been passed around quite a bit. It's Liam Neeson on uh, Ricky Gervais's show Extras. And he's basically doing the opposite of this. You know, Liam Neeson saying, I'm really funny. Ricky Gervais is like, okay, well, let's do some improv. And Liam Neeson keeps knowing everything that Ricky Gervais suggests. And you can see how quickly like that breaks down the process of creating something that's supposed to be funny. So that's the number one thing that everybody's thinking about. A couple other key protocols of the writer's room. People generally aren't laughing as much as you might think. Like people really try not to laugh unless it's actually funny. You really don't want to be like giving pity laughter or just to support somebody's pitch. So you really have to learn to absorb saying stuff that you think is funny that just gets no reaction. And sometimes, you know, it's smart and cool. And if you have the the, the gumption to put it in the script, you can do it. But we really have to rely on the actual like biological, sociological, emotional reaction of laughter to tell us what's funny because we don't really know. And that is very uncomfortable and awkward for people. Uh, and it's pretty harsh to deal with. You also definitely don't want to pitch taking something down unless you can replace it. So if Venkat has pitched like, okay, uh, I want to do this funny thing, I would never say, we're not doing that because it's not funny. I would I would say, oh, well, maybe we could do this slightly differently. You always have to be pitching a fix or you're just going to break down the process. And especially in the like episode of broadcast, the days of broadcast television, when you're doing 22 episodes that have to be on TV in a very set schedule, you're going to be working very late hours. The time pressure is going to be really extreme. And so you just can't break down the creative process. You have to keep the ball moving one way or another, even if it seems to be going nowhere. And so that's a lot of what the protocols are designed to do, to just keep creative energy flowing when it's at a, a, a very low uh, reserve. You would never, I would never say to somebody, that's not funny. It's just a killer thing to say. It destroys their spirit. It's very hard for them to recover from that emotionally and uh, status wise. So I'm very careful about that. On any show I've been on that's been successful, there's a showrunner and the showrunner is essentially the head writer, usually the creator of the show, but sometimes it's been passed on to somebody else. And the showrunner has to have a, a clear vision of what they're doing and they need to keep the ball moving. So if at some point they say, okay, we're going to do this episode and it's going to be about this, you have to just go with the flow because there's not enough time to challenge them and force them to defend uh, themselves. I've been a showrunner and if you are dealing with people who are constantly nitpicking what you're saying, it's just you, you don't have time or energy to deal with it. You have to keep moving on. So to any of you who are going to be a staff writer on protocols, I would say like, hey, if we're moving on on our episode, you have to just accept a no and we're going to move on. As I mentioned, we're going to be doing a lot of drawing from life. And in the writer's room, there's going to be a lot of um, talking about your life. It, it really won't be accepted to be private or to say like, hey, I don't talk about what me and my wife uh, do at home. That's coming out. Everything you have experienced in your life is going to be used for comedy. That's where comedy comes from. It's how you connect to audiences. You're going to have to bring something of yourself to the room. And then finally, the, the, kind of an interesting protocol that actually got sort of enshrined legally is basically you have the freedom in a writer's room to say pretty offensive things. There was a famous uh, lawsuit, a writer's assistant on Friends brought a lawsuit saying that she was in an environment that was sexually and racially harassing to her. And the lawsuit itself is pretty interesting. I put a lit link in the uh, notes that I'll hand out to you guys to, to read the deposition. And she describes a lot of really filthy and outrageous things that the writers were saying and doing. And uh, the case went to the California Supreme Court and they dismissed it. They said, basically, if they're creating a show called Friends and the, the show is about sexual situations and stuff, the writer's room is allowed to uh, talk about vulgar things. And you, you, you're not allowed to say that you're in an environment that's harassing. I actually had to watch a, a, a workplace safety training video here at my job. And they even the official HR video addressed this point. It was basically saying like, 
you know, the crew guy cannot talk as vulgarly as the people in the writer's room because they need to come up with whatever crazy situation. They might say something very offensive. They, that That's how things operate in the writer's room. And that has a is a cre creative freedom that here in California is basically uh, legally enshrined. Okay, so we've got a script. We're underway. The next thing we're going to do is have a table read. A table read is sort of like a rehearsal. We're going to read the script aloud with the actors. This is a picture of the... Um, Office TV show US finale table read. A little bigger than usual because it was the finale. Uh, I put I picked this particular picture because you can see me in it. But here's all the actors. There's Dwight, whatever. They're reading the script aloud, and we're just seeing if an audience reacts. And we're going to be very attuned to marking with a check mark or some other way. Like people laughed at this, people didn't laugh at that. Like that is feedback that we're getting. It's the first time we're getting it on a single camera show like The Office that won't be shot in front of an audience. It's especially important to get some feedback from an audience. Really the only way you know if something's funny is if an audience laughs at it. And it's pretty indisputable. If you have a table read and everybody's laughing, it worked. If you have a table read and nobody's laughing, it didn't work. You can't argue that it's funny and everybody was wrong. It's just that there's a protocol of listening to the audience at one point or another. And the table read is usually when most shows are gonna do that. Okay, so now we've got a script and we're ready to go. Next thing we're gonna do is casting. And casting is really, really hard. You would think that there'd be a lot of people who are out here aspiring to be actors. There are a lot of dramatic people. Every school has people in the drama club. You would think there would be a uh, surplus of amazing actors and there really isn't. It's really a really, really hard job to be an actor. You're very exposed. Uh, you can be made to look stupid very easily. It, it takes a huge amount of confidence. If you've never done any acting, I encourage you to try it and you will feel very strange and weird. Um, and the casting part of the process can really make or break a show. This is a famous example. This guy on the left, you probably know, that's Matthew Perry. He played Chandler on Friends, um, but he only got the part because this guy on the right, whose name was Craig Bierko, passed on the role. And the, the sort of urban legend is that Craig Bier that year there were many pilots. Craig Bierko was an in-demand comic actor and he was offered a pilot called Best Friends and he decided that would be better than Friends. So he took that one, pilot didn't get made. Friends went on to become a massively successful show. But you, know, you have to wonder whether had they cast somebody other than Matthew Perry, if that show's chemistry would have materialized. But basically what I'm trying to get to is that casting is hugely important, very, very hard to do. It's something that um, when you talk to people about TV shows, they often like don't understand how difficult it would be to cast stuff. I've had people who don't work in TV uh, pitch to me ideas for shows that sort of sound pretty good if you've never worked in TV production. Like, oh, why don't you have a show where every week it's about two different couples and they're dating and what's going on? Okay, it could be a very interesting show, extremely hard to cast. You would just, every single week, you'd have to audition tons of people. These days, you'd be looking at uh, videos that they're self-taping at home, but it would just be really, really hard to get talented actors. There aren't enough of them. It's hard. Okay, so next up, sorry, guys, my screen's being slightly glitchy. Once we've cast the show, we've got a script, we're going to go into production. And here we're getting to the most like technical level of protocol form. This is a call sheet for the show uh, Veep that I worked on. You can see it's it's a protocol type document. Everything up here is like where we're going to meet, where lunch is going to happen, <laughs> what the weather looks like, where the hospital is. I don't know if you guys have followed the case of uh, Rust, a show where uh, a movie in New Mexico where Alec Baldwin accidentally fired a gun that was loaded and killed someone. And this, mishaps on sets are common. Always want to know where a hospital is. All this stuff is saying what the scenes are and a short log line of the scene. And we're going to try and burn through this. Over here, we're seeing how many pages are going to be burned through. This is a pretty ambitious day. Six and six eighths of a page is a lot to shoot in one day. We're under time pressure from day one. You can see the call time is 6.30. We're going to start shooting at 7. We're going to be working till 7 uh, p.m. It's going to be a very hard, grueling day. There are certain union rules about like there has to be a lunch break. If you go over time, you're going to be in penalty. This is kind of an interesting aspect too. This is um, th where they break down the actors and who they are. And you can see they have numbers here. The cast is like numbered and they're basically ranked by how famous and important they are. Julia Louis-Dreyfus is number one on Veep. You you often, you'll, you'll hear on the walkie talkies on a set, like, hey, you know, number one is 10-1, which means she's going to the bathroom. 
Number one is over here. Like there, it's a code to communicate and make sure everybody knows who's everybody. But as you can see, it creates a pretty straightforward status hierarchy that can be kind of interesting and create some interesting dynamics. Steve Martin just published a book that's sort of like it's cartoons about his days in the movie business and uh his title of the book was number one is walking because that's the kind of thing they would say on the movie set when Steve is a you know star of the movie. Here's more details breaking down every department, the props, the uh, set dressing we might need, the grip is kind of going to be doing the electrical wiring and stuff. Sound, hugely important. A big difference between a professional production and an amateur one is sound. It's really, really hard to get good sound. You need very expensive lav mics that have to be working on a radio hookup that's not going to break down. It's very challenging. So you can see there's a detailed set of particular production protocols. <clears throat> I brought this up because I know you guys are interested in protocols, but I thought I'd focus today more on creative protocols. But this was kind of an interesting detail though I wanted to share with you guys. If you're ever here in LA and you drive around, you might see these little like uh, yellow signs that are pointing to a shoot. If you're shooting on location, you're moving around, crew needs to know where to go. You'll see these little signs that get put up by the crew. And they're usually in some kind of code because they don't want to say like, oh, Veep is shooting over here or some Lucky Lou's might come to see, you know, Julia Louis-Dreyfus or whatever. So they're often in a kind of strange code and people who are interested in codes and signs often get kind of obsessed with that aspect of production. But as you can see, a very detailed, rigorous set of protocols. They're usually governed by somebody who's called the first AD, the assistant director. They're in charge of making sure the production's moving smoothly. <clears throat> So finally, guys, I'm going to wrap it up and I'm going to make sure to talk about AI because uh, I know Venkat asked me to do that. But I just want to sort of summarize kind of where I see where we're at in TV comedy as business <clears throat> and where we're going in the future. So our show protocols, unfortunately, guys, even if we have a hit show, I don't think we're liable to get as rich as the producers of Friends or Seinfeld. The market is just a little different than it used to be. But in some ways, it's kind of back to um, historical models of television. This I Love Lucy, basically one of the, um, my screen's being a tiny bit glitchy, but basically one of the first hit sitcoms was I Love Lucy. Don't know if you guys have seen it. It was a classic. My mom used to love it and talk about it. And I Love Lucy was actually wholly sponsored by, uh, in its earliest days, by Philip Morris. It was sort of just a, uh, an elaborate commercial for Philip Morris cigarettes. The model that we're at now, if we were selling our protocols TV show, we'd be selling to Apple, uh, Disney. Uh, we'd be selling to Hulu, which is kind of a conglomerate of a couple of these companies. We might be selling to Paramount. So basically, we'd just be making a product for one gigantic corporation that is either using it to generate eyeballs for their streaming service or, you know, the, the model of selling ads is kind of out. And so it seems to me that we're kind of back to the days of a show having a single corporate sponsor, which is just kind of an interesting flow of history. I, thought that I threw this quote up from Joan Didion. Again, it's in the notes if you don't have time to read it. But basically what she's saying is that people think of Hollywood as kind of... Um, tawdry, lascivious, partying, sexual. And she's arguing that actually, no, it's it's really, it's kind of um, a little suppressed because it has the spirit of gambling. Gambling is the predominant instinct out here. And television and entertainment is really on a, a venture capital model. You really need to have hits to be profitable and you need to avoid embarrassing losses. And you can see how that would lead to um, you could avoid, if you want to save your job, you, it, it, it's tempting to go the most conservative route. You don't want to embarrass yourself with something really stupid and expensive that flops. But on the other hand, you're not going to get a lot of hits that way. And so balancing that out is a very difficult tension. This is a quote from David Oselznik, one of the great producers of the classic studio era in Hollywood. And he's saying basically, look, you can only make money with really expensive movies or really cheap movies. And I think that that is kind of continues to be a paradigm here in entertainment. Like you can make a lot of money on a big expensive thing like Titanic or Avatar or something. And you can make a lot of money on something really cheap and under the radar like Paranormal Activity or a horror movie you shoot for a million dollars. Similar with TV, like either you need to try and shoot, shoot the moon or you need to try and keep your budget really low because it's very hard to um, hit a middle ground. You're, you're trying to get hits and avoid flops. 
So guys, as we look at the TV landscape, there's a lot of transitions going on. I mean, just in my own career, we've gone from the world of broadcast to streaming. Uh, however, this is nothing new here in Hollywood. Like there have been transitions, uh, massive technological transitions since Hollywood began. The change from sound, the change to TV, the change to color, the change to cable, the model of VHSs and DVDs, and now into streaming. The constant technological change has affected the creative process and the creative protocols. But there have been some basic things that have endured throughout the years, and that's what I've tried to highlight here. A couple of common misunderstandings that people don't really understand that haven't worked in this field. One is casting, as I mentioned. Like, it's really hard to find good people. It takes time, uh, and it's difficult. So that is, like, if you think of a show that is going to have 30 characters, it's just going to be very, very hard to produce. We're just not going to find that many good people. You're lucky if you can find one or two really funny, talented people. Second, it's something that people always seem to bring up is like when you're talking about a TV writer's room, they often ask you like, what character do you write for? Which TV writers often joke about this because if you think about that, that it assumes that they're imagining that we're each like embodying a character and sitting in a room and just waiting for, you know, Dwight or who, uh, Steve Carell or whoever on the office to talk. That's not really how we operate. We're, we're working holistically to create stories together. And yes, it's true. Sometimes people are locked in a little more on one character or another, or connect to them in one way or another. But it's a little more holistic than people often think. And I bring that up just because it seems to be a common misunderstanding. Another common misunderstanding, and this is something I had to learn in my own uh, professional career, there's just limits to production. Doing something that's period, like it's said in the past, very, very hard because everybody has to be in an expensive costume. Uh, the cars have to be old, stuff like that. It's way easier to shoot something that's set today because it looks like today. It's hard to shoot something in snow. You got to set snow up. These are, these are sort of commonsensical things that actually people seem to miss. And when people are pitching their idea for a TV show, you can tell that they haven't thought about the realities of production. We, you know, we need to shoot it in a stage with limited expense on costumes, lights, sets, et cetera, limited. Another thing that people like seem to miss is that like the story is a lot more important than the jokes. When I was starting out, I was thinking of my favorite Simpsons episodes. I thought of my favorite jokes, what I liked. That was what I was repeating and that recess the next day. I thought that was what was most important in TV. But really what's most important is holding people's attention for 22 minutes, which is really, really hard. And you need to have motivated characters who have something at stake, who are doing battle. If you're going to follow and keep people's attention, there has to be emotions that are going to keep people rooted. So I'm going to come back to uh, AI. Here's another AI uh, image I generated of Venkat starring in a show about protocols. As you can see, it's not a, a perfect just yet. And I am somewhat of an AI uh, skeptic, but that may be my own bias because I don't want it to put me out of work. But I will mention that I definitely think there are going to be huge impacts of AI, uh, first of all, in production, in doing backgrounds, in doing uh, elaborate uh, motion capture kind of stuff. It's going to be huge. It's already happened. Uh, the, the, the cow's out of the barn on that. I was watching Shogun the other night. You can tell they're doing enormous amounts of digital creation of you know, 16th century Osaka. And I assume that AI is only going to get better and better at doing that. It's happening here in my work. I'm working on an animated show. They're already using AI to fill in um, backgrounds when they have to pull a prop or a character out. They used to have to repaint that individually by the artist. AI can do it now. We're already there. However, I do think that AI like is going to have some difficulties. So far, I've found it to be a pretty shit writer. It can't tell a story that I care about yet. Um, and scripted comedy is an old profession. I mean, Aristophanes and Shakespeare were writing scripted comedies. It's an old job. I think it might endure for a long time. On the other hand, I'm prepared to acknowledge there's technological change. You know, stonemason uh, was an old job too, and you don't hear about too many of them walking around. There is a bit of an uncanny valley problem already, and I'm not sure how long it will take to get to that last 10% where like an AI figure really looks alive. Um, it might take a minute. Uh, I know for years now I've been hearing about electric cars and we've made enormous progress on that, but that last 10% is pretty hard to do. And to make people fall in love with the AI character the way they did with like Jennifer Aniston or something, I think is gonna take a long time. But I do recognize it's gonna take a lot of um, changes to production. My bigger fear is competition like this. Screens, phones, video games, 
these are eating, they've already begun to eat into scripted storytelling. It's changing uh, the way people watch TV. It's changing how we interact with entertainment. It's already happened. I'm more worried about that than uh, AI. Um, but maybe there are some ways that uh, humans and AI can work together on generating scripted comedy. Uh, I'm looking to you guys for help on that. So that's my talk. Uh, questions. What can I do for you guys? Hey, Steve, will you be, we're a little bit over time. Are you, or actually we're right on time, but are you willing to stay a few minutes over time to answer Absolutely. questions? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I went over. No, no worries. Dorian. Howdy. Thank you, Steve. Um, I am curious if there is somewhere hiding a set of specimens of pitches. Great, um, great question. Yeah. Keep, do, do, sorry. I, I, I've thought about this a lot myself. In fact, I uh, thought that it would be helpful to create a project like that of like compiling some. It seemed like something that the Writers Guild should actually do, like having a, a, a little video of a bunch of, of pitches that you could watch and know what you're getting into. I don't know of any compendium like that. I know that on if you go to YouTube, you can probably type in like movie pitches. There are some that are by a guy named Max Landis, who's the son of the director, John Landis, and he sold a lot of movies. He then sort of got in trouble for some like Me Too related allegations and is uh, kind of an off-putting character, but he was pretty compelling at pitching movies. And I know he put a lot of them on YouTube. Huh. Uh, if you browse YouTube for Hollywood pitches, you might see a few of them, but yeah, it's it's a gap in knowledge. And I think that it would be helpful to um, compile some. Um, I, over like 20 years or something, I've only seen you know, like one or two a year when a friend wants to practice one on me. And the people you're pitching to have seen hundreds. They, they're seeing them all day, every day. So exactly. It's, it's a I weird, mean, yeah. Similar with like VC stuff, I would wager too. They just sit there all day long watching pitches. And so the, you know, where are they? And I would imagine it's a, it's a, they're unorganized and they are also kind of close to the chest as a rule anyway. Yeah. It's you know, a, a departure from that for anything, but like, yeah, you know, a, you know, the content itself and B, did it get the, did it win the, uh, um, did it win the bid? Yeah. That would be a useful project. I think certainly in my industry and probably in, in, uh, VC tech as well. Thanks. And a question from Venkat. Yeah. Um, the uh, VC connection, just a quick uh, remark on that. Um, while I spent a year at Andreessen Horowitz, one of the most useful learning experiences uh, for me was sitting in on the VC side. So I saw like 50, 60 pitches in the course of like a month. And I think um, I'm still like mining that uh, experience for um, you know consulting in tech. Uh, but the question I wanted to ask is, uh, I think I watch TV a lot more than movies, partly because any investment you make in understanding the world and relating to the characters, it's sort of like you can, it pays off over years and years, right? Like you start watching Dr. Who, you learn the world and even though the character changes to regenerations, it's like a more than a decade that you can be a fan. Whereas a movie, you put in a lot of upfront investment and um, you kind of like usually just get one. And I think uh, extended universes kind of like are trying to create that uh, TV style uh, emotional investment dynamic. But on the uh, producer side, one aspect that truly interests me about that is things like the showrunner Bible or other like extremely long-term continuity things, world building, showrunner's Bible that allow this kind of like multi-year, multi-decade even um, structure to emerge. So uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, I, I haven't worked on shows that have been like hugely dependent on that. I mean, The Office over time, like nine years or something, like developed a lot of lore and there would be people who would be sort of like the keepers of that. They would just, for whatever reason, have the encyclopedic brain of that. But I imagine on a big drama show, like uh, there'd be a lot of rigorous work on keeping all of that straight. And you can tell when it, when it went wrong. I mean, I, I know there was a lot of disappointment in like the finale of Lost because it didn't really answer a lot of questions and, and uh, there was sort of a breakdown of uh, showrunner's Bible kind of stuff. So I haven't worked on a lot of drama shows. I can't speak to that from huge experience, but 
I know that on a, a on the show I'm working on now, an animated show that's serialized, we had to be pretty rigorous about like timeline, uh, where everybody is at different times, making sure that scenes, you know, one person's having a scene that's happening at the same time as somebody else, but character A is in Switzerland, character B is in the US. What are the times of day? A lot of that stuff's going on. You need to have a really good, that that would be a job that I would delegate to the writer's assistant to keep an eye on that. And we had a really good one who helped us with that. Um, but yeah, that's a huge challenge. And in terms of formal procedure for keeping that straight, I'm not aware of it, but I imagine like the big drama show runners like probably have like some smart systems in place for keeping track of all of that. But similar to pitches, like one thing that happens is like, knowledge evolves on a show and then it's gone and maybe somebody takes it to the next show that they work on uh but it's sort of, sort of each place evolves its own way of working and it doesn't necessarily get translated or communicated to other shows and that could be really valuable i mean that that, that is something that we could all work better on just a quick follow-up on that do you have any favorite uh, so I guess this is kind of the preamble to the Bible-like artifacts, like 22 rules of writing on the show. Uh, Gene Roddenberry had one for Star Trek. There's like Pixar has 22 rules of storytelling. Um, are there like things like that that you rely on or is it kind of much more circumstantial? I, I'm obsessed with that stuff and I read them. There's one, I'll put it in the uh, notes I'll send you guys. It's a memo from David Mamet to the writers of a show he had called The Unit. That's really, it's just like, really funny, really scolding about how they were writing scenes that were undramatic because as he said in the bluntest possible words, like it has to be about somebody wants something and what's going to happen if they don't get it. And every scene has to be the negotiation of trying to get something. And as soon as you, you aren't talking about that, the show's boring. It's it's losing air. That's a big one that I refer to. I've read all the, any, I've read every book about writing you can think of. I'm into it. I, I think too much formal uh, rule-based stuff can get you into trouble, but uh, all the Pixar stuff is helpful. Um, Roddenberry is helpful. Uh, Stephen King's book is great. Tina Fey's book is great. In comedy, it can be a little, you can break the rules a little more, I think, than you can in, in, a, in a dramatic show. Any more questions? I don't see anything in the forum cool well guys i was delighted to be here and hopefully provided some value um happy to talk more with anybody who wants to talk i'll put together a document to send to you guys to give some um some of the links and quotes and stuff i talked about um but it was an honor to be part of this thanks very much for having me yeah thanks that was thanks, super Steve. awesome now i feel like i kind of want to pitch a protocol show and <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you this is great Okay, awesome, guys. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. And the thanks again to Steve for an awesome talk. The next speakers on March 20th, Wednesday, will be Jonathan Blake and Mills Gilman of the Bergman Institute. Be sure to check out summerprotocols.com for research from last summer the forums for these awesome conversations from the town halls and upcoming information about this summer's cohort.